talking about uh, as we move forward with revolutionary mothers and fathers, we're going to be talking about Abigail and John Adams, Deborah Sampson, Lydia Dara, and Joseph Warren. If you have any questions throughout, please feel free to send it via Facebook. I'll do my best to answer it during the presentation or afterwards. If you are watching this on tape delay, feel free to leave questions and I will answer, but we will get started. So Abigail Adams, born in 1744, dies in 1818. She is the first lady of the United States, although that term was not really used until about 1838 when an author wrote a book about Martha Washington and called her the first lady. At the time, wives of the president were called Lady Washington or Lady Adams, whatever it may be. So it's not until much later that first lady is actually used. Abigail Adams is probably the first true first lady who was heavily involved and really a confidant of her husband. Think of, say, Michelle Obama or Hillary Clinton or to some degree Nancy Reagan, whomever it may be. Uh, Abigail Adams plays a very important role in history. She is the wife, of course, of John, who's the second president, and the mother of John Quincy Adams, who is our sixth president. She and John Adams wrote prolific letters which were saved. Many historical figures of the day, the Washingtons among them, destroyed all their letters before their deaths. So there was really no historical record from that standpoint. But the Adamses were really one of the most prolific couples to write letters uh, in history, which has been the basis for many books for the John Adams series on HBO from a few years ago. So they play a very important role. Abigail was born to William Smith and Elizabeth Quincy Smith, who William is a congregational minister. Abigail is the second of four children. Remember from our discussion yesterday that we said women at the time especially women from poorer households, were not educated. Abigail was fortunate that her mother had, and her parents, I should say, because her father's a congregational minister, also remember from yesterday, ministers play a huge role in educating men, sometimes women, uh, because the educational system wasn't set up. So much like parents today, because of our current health situation, are doing a lot of homeschooling, it was similar back in colonial times. Abigail was educated at home. She read widely in her father's expansive library. Um, and because her father is a congregational minister, he has access uh, to very important people in Boston society, New England society. Abigail wanted to marry John, who is a Harvard-educated lawyer who is nine years older than Abigail, but Abigail's dad did not think John was quite a catch. He actually did not approve of the marriage. Uh, during their first 10 years of their marriage, Abigail gives birth to five children, including, of course, John Quincy Adams and then Charles Francis Adams, who... Uh, plays heavily in politics in the 1820s and 30s and 40s. Abigail, remember yesterday we said that during the Revolutionary War, the roles of women changed, changed dramatically in society, just as they did in the Civil War and World War I and World War II, where women were more involved in the workplace and educating children and taking care of family farms and family businesses and the like. So she managed, Abigail managed the second decade of her marriage to John on her own, because when we talk about John next in greater detail, he's a member of the Continental Congress. He's heavily involved in revolutionary politics as a minister uh, to France and then to England and of course, then as vice president and, and president moving forward. 
Uh, their correspondence, as I said, gives a rich account of their daily activities and their thinking as things are boiling over from a revolutionary standpoint. It is from these letters that historians were able to conclude that Abigail played a very significant role in John's career. She was his biggest cheerleader. John was a bit cantankerous. He didn't have the greatest social skills, um, but Abigail was there to help smooth those rough edges. Uh, because of her devotion to the family phone and John's business affairs while he is away during the revolution, the Adamses avoided financial ruin that really befell other families because of the separation during the revolution. Abigail was a firm supporter of independence. Prior to the declaration, really prior to Lexington and Concord, many of the founding fathers, Ben Franklin among them, were not quite as fiery as Sam Adams and John Hancock and even John Adams. They still considered themselves Englishmen and were looking for ways to resolve the differences with Great Britain rather than going to war and not only going to war, but really declaring independence. It's not until Lexington and Concord and then truly the Battle of Bunker Hill, actually Breed's Hill, which we'll talk about a little bit later when, when blood is actually spilled, uh, that people say, okay, it is now time for independence. Thomas Paine, who we talked about yesterday in Common Sense, also played a gigantic role in moving the population towards independence. In March of 1776, when John is preparing to get with the Continental Congress um, to write a statement of principles that would be adopted by the Continental Congress and really becomes the basis of the Declaration of Independence, Abigail's favorite famous quote, pardon me, is, remember the ladies and more and favorable to them than your ancestors. So she is saying, hey, this is opportunity to do what is necessary. How there was a discussion by John Locke, Sir Francis Bacon, that women have to be treated because women are the truest source of virtue and they are the responsible for the children, particularly male children, and giving them to and so it's in after this quote um, that Abigail, although she's saying, re remember the ladies, she did not strongly support a woman's right to vote. It's hard for us to imagine that in contemporary times. But in her day, that was not a major issue. Um, in 1784, she joins John in Europe. So the Treaty of Paris has been signed in 1783. She is with John as he is now a minister. He's the first minister of the United Colonies and really the United States at this point. Late in 1788, the Adamses come back to the United States. Uh, and what they do is they basically shuttle back and forth. Yes, they still have the family farm in Braintree, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. But they're also going back and forth between the two capitals, Philadelphia and New York, and the family home in Massachusetts. She missed John's inauguration in March of 1797 because she's taking care of John's sick mother. And during his presidency, she often stays back in Massachusetts to take care of family matters. So this ties in pretty yesterday we talked about how women assumed a much greater role at home, uh, again, with family affairs and businesses and so forth, and it's being shown here. As first lady, she kept a very rigorous daily schedule, rising at 5 a.m. to manage the White House, the busy home, and to receive callers two hours a day. 
Imagine that today, you know, being able to walk up to the White House. You may want to, but uh, for two hours a day, open access to the First Lady and potentially the President. Unlike Martha Washington, who had been a gracious hostess but avoided all political discussion, Abigail was much involved in the debates of the day. As the two major political factions were being formed, and this is where our good friend Alexander Hamilton comes in, you have the Federalists. John Adams is a Federalist. Quite frankly, he's the last Federalist president. Washington is a Federalist. Federalists want a strong, central, national government. Democratic Republicans, who are led by Thomas Jefferson, believe that power should be dispersed, a more agrarian society. So you can see where Hamilton, who's a Federalist, and Jefferson, who's a Democratic Republican, not confuse those terms with Democrat or Republican today. They're totally different. But you can see where Jefferson and, and Hamilton, who already had issues with each other, most amongst them jealousy, uh, in the two different political parties really helped to separate them and, and grow that breach. So as both factions are developing, um, Abigail points out to John Adams's friends that, that here's what she says about Alexander Hamilton. Um, she writes, quote, he is the very devil, lasciviousness himself, unquote. Her critics objected that as first lady, she should not insinuate herself in political discussions. Sound familiar when we talked about Hillary Clinton? When we really any first lady who gets involved, Michelle Obama, uh, Nancy Ford, or Nancy Ford, pardon me, Nancy Reagan would just say no. You know, people are saying, why are first ladies involved? And in many cases, the first lady is the you know truest confidant of the president. So Abigail Adams plays a very, very big role in history. We're going to move on to John Adams, her husband. He is born in 1735. He dies on July 4, 1826. The 50th anniversary of independence. Little trivia, which many of you may know, Thomas Jefferson dies on the same day. If this happens in a movie, you'd say, come on, no way that this happens. But when Jefferson dies, his quote is, Adams outlives me. And it's actually not true. Adams is at first. So John Adams is an early advocate of independence. He also Similar to Hamilton, they both play such gigantic roles in the founding of this country. They kind of get lost in the wake of Washington and Jefferson. So many other players at the time, we would you know, pay dearly to have one of them around today. We were fortunate to have so many of them around during the founding of our country. He's the author of the Massachusetts Constitution, state constitution, in 1780. He's the signer of the Treaty of Paris. He's the first U.S. ambassador to the court of St. James, 1785 to 1788. He's the first vice president, second president. Although he's regarded by his contemporaries as one of the most significant statesmen of the era in the 19th century, his reputation fades. You know, much like Hamilton did. Hamilton was not. His reputation was actually revived about 100 years after his death, thanks to his relatives who said, hey, you know, these are really important things that were done. Same thing happens with John Adams. The modern edition of his correspondence, which is gigantic, not only his letters, but all of his writings, it really prompted a rediscovery of his personality. And he bought at times, but he was blunt and honest. His importance as a political thinker came back to the forefront. His realistic perspective on U.S. foreign policy, which really plays a gigantic role in the next hundred years after his presidency. He's the oldest of three sons of Deacon John Adams and Susanna Boylston of Braintree, Massachusetts. Anybody growing up in the Boston area or familiar with it, Boylston is a big name. Boylston Street, after that, 
Adams's father is a farmer, a shoemaker, but the Adams family could actually trace its lineage all the way back to the first generation of Puritan settlers in New England. A local selectman and a leader in his community, John Adams' his father, Deacon Adams, tried to push his son into a career in the ministry. In keeping with that goal, John Adams goes to Harvard College in 1755. For the next three years, he actually teaches grammar school and says, you know what, I don't want to be a preacher. I don't want to go into that service much like my father did. He eventually chooses law, and in 1758, he begins practicing law in Boston. Remember, back in those days, law schools are not set up the way that lawyers, you know, Alexander Hamilton, John Adams, and the like, the way that they become lawyers is they intern with practicing lawyers for a period of one to three years. Um, in 1764, John marries Abigail. Abigail, as I said, becomes a confidant and a political partner who helps to stabilize John, who, again, can fly off the handle a little bit, not nearly as much as his cousin Sam, but still can be unpredictable. Um, their first son, John Quincy Adams, is born in 1767. Their first child, Abigail Amelia, is actually born in 1765. By that point, John Adams's legal career is taking off and flourishing in Boston. Think about what's going on, the Stamp Act and the Townsend Acts. The Boston Massacre takes place as well in 1770. In 1765, John Adams writes, quote, a dissertation on the canon feudal law, unquote, which justifies feudal opposition to the recently enacted Stamp Act. He says, basically, Parliament does not have the right to do this. He's attacking it from a legal standpoint. John Adams, one of the backbones, at least until he becomes president and you know, has the Midnight Appointments, the Alien and Sedition Acts, the law is his guide. So it is 1770 after the Boston Massacre where colonists are provoking uh, the Red Coast by throwing snowballs and ice at them. The Red Coast took fire and kill several colonists. Of course, uh, Paul or Sam Adams, excuse me, Sam Adams, uh, Paul Revere makes an engraving of the Boston Massacre, and of course, it's then used and marketed in such a way by the Sons of Liberty and by revolutionaries. John Adams says, hey, I will the British soldiers because it's based on principle. John Adams gets them acquitted. His cousin Sam is in the courtroom every day, and I'm sure steam is coming out of his ears as John is providing a very able defense and, again, gets the soldiers acquitted. In 1774, Adams is elected to the Massachusetts delegation that joins representatives from 12 of the 13 colonies in Philadelphia for the First Continental Congress. He and his cousin Sam quickly become the leaders of the radical faction. When the Continental Congress first gets together, the other colonies are considering this a war really in New England, although we're not at war yet. But they're saying New England is full of antagonizers. The Boston Massacre, the Boston Tea Party. It's because of them that these things are happening. Adams, who is really one of the great leaders of the Continental Congress, has the foresight as they move forward and talk about writing the Declaration of Independence. And when they talk about who's going to command our army, army in quotes, because it's not a true army, he's smart enough to say, in order to bring the other colonies into the struggle, into the fight, we have to have a Virginian write the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson. We have to have a Virginian lead our troops, George Washington. In the instance of, of Washington, it's, it's kind of a slam dunk because he is the most experienced 
military leader in the colonies, which isn't saying much because it's a low bar. He, of course, gets his experience during the French and Indian War. As he writes, Adams does, writes various essays which push forward the idea, the constitutional and legal argument of separation. So he's trying to take emotion out of it. Of course, he's being thrown under that bus. You New Englanders are all emotional. Why you want to break away? And he's saying constitutionally, this is why we should do it. By the time of the Second Continental Congress in 1775, he is known as Ennis. Um, as I said, he is the one who suggests that Washington should lead the army, that Jefferson should write the Declaration of Independence. Of course, Jefferson writes his first draft, and Adams and Ben Franklin rip it, not to shreds, but they edit it quite a bit, and Jefferson was not happy with it. Um, Adams writes a book called Thoughts on Government, which circulate through about the colonies, much the way that common sense does by Thomas Paine, to allow people to read and say, hey, this is why we need to do this. This is why we need to break away and have independence. Um, he goes on to say that, quote, talking about a representative assembly, not a parliament, but a representative assembly, he says, quote, it should be in measure an exact portrait of the people at large. It should Think, feel, reason, and act like them. So he's saying it's got to come from the people and mirror the people. Of course, the initial Congress does not, and some might say our current does not as well, because it's wealthy landowners and such when we first start our country that are congressmen that serve in the Congress. Adams remains the central figure of the Continental Congress. In July 1776, he drafts what is called the plan of treaties. It's a document that provides the framework for the treaty with France to bring them into the revolution with us. Remember I said yesterday, France didn't come to our aid because they wanted to see a democratic republic formed. They came because they wanted to see the English get kicked in the teeth and hoping that they can get some of the scraps from the English table once they fall. He moves on. He is the unanimous choice to head the board of war and ordinance. Basically, is made a one-man war department. This is before Congress. This is before the Constitution. We're talking during the, during the Revolution. He helps to create the U.S. Navy, which again, relative terms, uh, during the Revolution. He joins Ben Franklin in Paris in the late 70s, in 1777, 1778, um, to help to move the French towards support. Of course, Adams is as serious as a heart attack as a diplomat, and Franklin leverages his celebrity as lightning and key and the kite, the whole nine yards. He's leveraging that. He wears a coonskin cap around France because everybody's, romanticizes Franklin, whereas Adams is upset by this. He's saying, hey, we're here for a serious reason. We shouldn't be going to parties and playing chess and doing all these things. But both of them together accomplish what needs to be accomplished. Of course, it also helps that the colonists win at the Battle of Saratoga, which really brings the French onto our side. The favorable terms achieved in in the Paris are attributed to both Franklin and Adams. Adams' reputation for being emotional goes to another level because, again, he's with Franklin and he does not agree with everything that Franklin does here. Um, let me see. I'm just trying to cut out a couple of things here which are redundant. Uh, although Adams is misunderstood by his contemporaries, he still is seen as truly one of the lions of revolution. He writes in the late 1780s, early 1790s, think what's happening, we're writing the Constitution and such. The Massachusetts Constitution, which he wrote in 1780, is the basis for our U.S. Constitution. But he writes in a defense of the constitutions of government 
of the United States of America in 1787. Sounds pretty dry, but it's very important. He also writes other books which talk about the importance of moving forward. Okay, we've achieved independence, but it's right. This is how we have to do it. Because of this, and if you have not seen the HBO series on Adams, I highly recommend it. I also recommend the book by David McCullough on John Adams. Absolutely fascinating. But it really paints a great picture of Adams and his contributions to the revolution and also to the country. We're going to move on to Deborah Sanson. Deborah Sanson, in 1783, there's a young soldier by the name of Robert Shirtlife, S-H-U-R-T-L-I-E-F-F, who is being treated by a doctor in one of the Revolutionary War camps. As the doctor goes to check Robert Shirtlife's pulse and puts a hand on Robert Shirtlife's chest to check heartbeat, he real, the doctor realizes that Robert Shirtlife is a woman. That woman is Deborah Sampson. She had been serving in the nation for three years without disclosing that she was a woman. Her uh, peers in the army gave her a hard time because she couldn't grow a beard and they started calling her Molly, thinking that she was Robert. So Deborah is really one of the first. Of course, we think of Molly Pitcher, but Deborah Sampson is one of the first to serve the revolution. Deborah, once it's found out, is not allowed to stay in the army, but she is dishon or pardon me, she is honorably discharged, and she is given money, enough money to get her home. She then goes on to lecture through the colonies about her time in the army, and she says, "I should get back pay for my service." She gets it in 1792. In 1805, Congress grants her a pension as a Revolutionary War veteran. She recently was declared the state heroine, the official state heroine of Massachusetts. Her official date is May 23rd. Deborah Sampson, again, one of the first women to serve in the Revolution. The next woman that we are going to talk about is Leah, D-A-R-R-A-G-H. Lydia is a Quaker from Philadelphia. She becomes a Patriot spy during the Revolution. Her courageous efforts help rescue or help George Washington and his army avoid disaster in December of 1777 in the Philadelphia suburbs of White Marsh. She was born in 1729 in Dublin. She comes to America with her husband in 1753, or pardon me, in 1756. They moved to Philadelphia in September of 1777. So we've got the Battle of Brandywine. You're going to have the Battle of Germantown, which are, or which are colonial losses as Washington is going head-to-head -head with the British. The British are more concerned about taking New York and taking Philadelphia and really destroying Washington's army. Washington is smart enough to say, hey, if you want it, you got it, take it, it's fine, as long as I can live to fight another day. Um, so what happens is the British march in Philly when Washington tries to retake in October, he fails. So he and his troops head out to White Marsh. Nearly a third of the Philadelphia population evacuate, including Lydia Duras' children. The British use her son or use her home as headquarters. Sir William Howe establishes his camp in the Dura House. They hold meetings in the Dura House. The British, this is amazing. Again, if this was a movie, you would not believe it. But the British say, while we're having our meetings, you, Dura family, and really it's the parents now, you have to stay in your bedrooms. Well, Lydia is in a closet in the same room as the meeting. At one meeting where she hears about Howe's plans to destroy Washington and the army. On December 4th, she gets a pass from the British Army asking to go out and see her children in the suburbs 
and then go to a flour mill in a city, just outside of the city. She goes to what is called the Rising Sun Tavern in Philadelphia. It's a known Patriot Message Center. And she's able to get information to Washington saying, be on your toes because the British are coming. What happens that the message gets to Washington, of course, the army survives, an attack is averted, and the British say, what the heck is going on here? Who told them? She denies it, even though Hal asks her to her face, and Hal, again, believes her. Uh, in June of 1778, Dura, or pardon me, the British leave Philly, and Dura is united with her children. Her husband dies in 1783 after the revolution. She moves to a new town in Philly in 1786 and runs a store until her death in 1789. There, there are questions for about the next 50 years, or 40 years, pardon me, about her story, her spying story, but they are confirmed by British soldiers who back up the account when they find out after the fact her involvement. The last in individual we're going to talk about today is Joseph Warren. Joseph Warren is born in 1741 and dies in 1775. The flag behind me plays a big role in what we're about to talk about. Extra credit for anybody who can tell me what this flag is, is represents or what it is from. Um, what I can tell you is this flag plays a huge role throughout the revolution. So Warren is born in Roxbury, Massachusetts. He is the oldest of four sons. His father is also Joseph Warren. His father dies falling out of an apple tree. Tough way to go. His son, Joseph Jr. is Harvard, teaches briefly at the Latin school and then becomes a physician. He marries his wife, Elizabeth Hooten in 1764, she comes from a very wealthy family and brings a dowry uh, as part of a considerable fortune to the, to the marriage. Warren begins his particip participation in the Rebel Cause in 1767 with the passage of the Townsend Acts, which we talked about yesterday. Warren's response, and this seems way to go in colonial America, he writes a series of articles in the Boston Gazette under the pseudonym, quote, a true patriot, unquote. The articles angered the royal governor, Hutchinson, who we talked about yesterday. He attempts to charge Warren and the publishers of the newspaper with Lyle, libel, pardon me, but a grand jury refuses to charge them. Warren's star rises, even though his name is not on the article, because people start to put two and two together that he's the writer. He is tight with Sam Adams, of course, one of the leaders of the Sons of Liberty. He is also close, close with James Otis, who is his brother-in-law. He has a Masonic connection with Paul Revere. So he's right, running in some very tight circles in colonial Boston. Warren becomes chairman of the Committee of Safety after the Boston Massacre. He delivers two famous speeches on the anniversaries of the event. When Sam Adams is away in Philly in 1774 attending the Continental Congress, Warren assumes his leadership role and becomes involved with the raising of militias. Remember, there's no colonial army, it's really more state militia. And also he is working to get arms and ammunition and powder and those sorts of things. A few months later, in 1774, Adams and John Hancock, John Hancock, pardon me, return to Massachusetts to find that the king has a bounty on their heads. The British army heads out of Boston on April 18th, 1775, to find Adams and to find Hancock dead or alive. Of course, the next day what happens, Lexington and Con when Warren hears about what's going on in Lexington and Concord, he leaves his patients that he's taking 
care of to ride out to the battle. He spends the next six weeks getting the militia ready for inevitable, inevitable battles. Pardon me. For his efforts, he is, a, he is elected second general in command of Massachusetts forces by the Provincial Congress on July 75. After meeting of safety at General Arnold's headquarters in Cambridge Common on the morning of June 17, 1775, Warren learns that the British have landed troops at Charlestown. At about noon, Warren rides out to U.S. fortifications on Breed's Hill. What happens is then militia troops come out thinking that are going to Bunker Hill. They actually go to Breed's Hill, which is right next to Bunker Hill. Warren refuses to take command of the troops and says, I would rather fight on the lines with the, the men. Breed's, the Battle of Bunker Hill is extremely important. Lexington and Concord, there is blood spilled. The British argument is that the colonials are fighting like cowards, hiding behind rocks and trees and walls. Whereas at Bunker Hill, the Battle of Bunker, Bunker Hill, the British outnumber the colonials, but the colonials high ground and dig trenches. The British send three separate assaults against the high ground, and on the first two, the Americans hold them back, even though they really have no cannons. All they have are shot and musket, but again, they have the high ground. It's on the third assault that the British take Bunker Hill, and it's also on the third assault. While Warren is trying to rally the militia who are retreating, that Warren is killed. Warren is buried as an insult by the British in a mass grave. He is not given his own separate grade. His, his remains actually identified by Paul Revere, who had made a set of wooden teeth for Warren, and that's how Warren's body is identified. Warren becomes the first true hero of the revolution. His death is lies. There's a painting by John Trumbull called The Death of General Warren. The flag behind me is the Bunker Hill flag. It is based, the pine tree in the corner represents peace. The cross is St. George's cross. A lot of early U.S. flags are based on British flags, which is ironic because, of course, we break away and assume independence. King Solomon's Lodge, to get back to, Mr., to Dr. Warren, they honor their grand master, the Bunker Hill Monument. Warren being the Grand Master. It, the monument resides at the base of the present monument. In New England, every state has a town named in Joseph Warren's honor. He leaves four small children who are orphaned because their mother actually died before the revolution in April 1773. Because both parents are dead. The welfare of the children is highly suspect. Who, who stood to the war? You're not going to believe this. Benedict Arnold actually donates $500 to the education of the Warren children. Arnold had actually befriended Warren at Cambridge. Arnold then petitions Congress for the amount of major general's half pay to ensure that the children are taken care of, and basically until they reach maturity. So again, you can see how it's not a very common name unless you're a complete history nerd like me or others, but Warren plays an absolutely huge role. And again, think of in, in wars, any war, think of those soldiers who are immortalized because of their actions whether it's in the Civil War, World War I, World War II, the Iraq War, the Vietnam War, on and on and on. This is before you have the Medal of Honor and the Purple and all those other sorts of things. So it's really important to these people. So we're going to stop there today. 
Uh, we're a minute or two early. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to leave them here on the site. Uh, I will then answer your questions. We will start again tomorrow at noon sharp. We'll start with the Washingtons and, and work our way forward. Uh, that will be episode number three of History for Shut-Ins. I will also leave a list. I've had a question or two. What book have I read that I would recommend on this time period? I will leave that information here on the site. But I appreciate everybody taking time out of their socially distanced day to join me. And we'll see you tomorrow. And thanks so much. And stay